Om Asato Ma Sadagamaya Tamaso Mahaham Johoti Gamaya Mritu Hormam Amrita Gamaya Avir Avir Maedhi Rudra Yate Dakshinam Mukaham Te Namaham Pahini Tiam Om Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. And reach us through and through ourselves. And evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet, compassionate face. <clears throat> so my subject this morning is of happiness. And we're going to be talking about happiness, about well-being, and about joy and divine bliss. Each one of us comes into the world. We know not where from. And we live our lives, and when we die, we leave this world, and we go, we know not where. But while we're here in the world, we spend a lot of our time trying to figure it all out. And we want to know why are we here, what's the point? What does it all mean? What is the purpose? And meanwhile, we're trying to avoid pain and suffering and trying to find a little happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. And uh, what makes you happy? may be different from what makes other people, what makes me happy. But it seems like we're all driven by the same desire, that same longing for happiness. And we think, in fact, that it was happiness that would give purpose and uh, meaning to our lives. So it's the question before us then this morning is what is happiness? And how can I get it? Now, um, if we look at ourselves in our present situation, we can ask, am I happy? And, um, well, we all know that if we get something that we really do want, that it does seem to give us happiness. And, uh, but of course, uh, when we think about it, it it's it, it, that, that um, satisfaction that happiness is uh, temporary. It's transient, true. If we think about it, it's, it's also it's going to be imperfect. Happiness, misery, two sides of the same coin. Whenever you get the coin, you look at the other side. So it's not going to be perfect happiness. And um, of course, it's never enough. We always want more. And uh, if I get something more, 
Will I be happy? Uh, well, not really. We're still in the same, we still have the same problem. And we're like the um, pious farmer who kept acquiring more and more land. And uh, that was because every, every night he would pray to God and he would say, Lord, I'm not a greedy man. He said, I just, my prayer is only uh, that if you'll be so kind as just to let me have the land which is next to mine. That's all he wanted. So um, we can see that if that's your only desire, the land which is next to yours, that um, you won't find complete uh, happiness and fulfillment until you get all the land. And that is, we won't find the happiness that we seek until we get everything. And when we think about it, that's really what we want. We want everything. We want it all. And it makes sense because uh, these little happinesses don't fill me up. The only thing that's going to fill me up was, is, is everything. And uh, so then the question is, uh, how can I get everything? How can I get unlimited infinite happiness? Now that's more of an interesting question. Because that is what we want. And life, well, we look at our life, it's a, we're in a constant struggle to get happiness, to a sense of feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of uh, contentment, peace. And uh, the problem is, is that you can't, it, that you, when you keep getting units, finite units of happiness, they, don't, they keep adding up, but they never seem to approach infinity. They never seem to, because uh, you can't add the, 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 that's just mathematics, right? You can't, the more and more and more is not any closer than the drop of water. Then you get a pond of water, you can make it a whole lake of water, and you make it a whole ocean of water, but the ocean isn't, in, in terms of extent, is not any closer to infinity than the drop. And so we still want more. And uh, so therefore our struggle for happiness, it seems to be somehow futile, futile. I can't gain the complete fulfillment that I want, and yet I can't stop desiring. I can't stop seeking for happiness either. And so the question then is, how can we solve that problem? And, um, Of course, the teaching of Vedanta is going to be to anticipate. <laughs> it's going to be that we really don't have a problem. But now, for now, our question is how can we gain unlimited happiness? And um, each one of us has that I, an idea. There are different kinds of happiness. And each one of us has an idea of the kind of, of what, what we mean by what will make us happy. We have different goods. Everyone has a different good. And thank God, in a pluralistic society, we're all free to pursue our own idea of what is good. Because we don't all agree. So everyone has their own idea of what's good. 
The good is that which gives us meaning and purpose and happiness and joy and fulfillment. That's the good. That's the good. And then also there are uh, the yoga psychologists tell us it's different degrees of happiness also. And we can imagine a man. Here's the degrees. The degrees are priya, moda, and pramoda. And we can imagine a man who is walking along through a street market. Now, you can visualize yourself in far off India. And you're going through a street market, a bazaar. And uh, it's very bizarre. <laughs> because whenever you're walking along there, maybe you're very, you see, you're going to see jugglers and, and magicians, and you're going to see uh, uh, musicians. You're going to see street urchins and throngs of people walking around everywhere. Look around, you're going to see uh, bunches of exotic uh, flowers, and you're going to see colored, brightly colored cloths and clothes, and uh, heaps of fragrant spices. The man is walking through the market. He sees all that. Suddenly his eyes light upon a fruit vendor and the fruit vendor is selling mangoes and there's some ripe delicious mangoes that are right there in the front of the uh, of the vendor stand and this man he loves mangoes that's the thing he loves more than anything feeling also a little bit a little bit hungry so when he sees those mangoes Immediately into his mind and heart, there jumps a feeling of happiness. It's called Priya. Yeah, he feels very good there. Very good. It goes over to the mango stand. And um, ask the man, how much of these mangoes? Well, it costs one rupee. Well, okay, very good. He said, uh, choose, looks very carefully at them, chooses one which is just particularly ripe and delicious. So this will be my, this will be the I'll buy this mango. Please prepare it for me. And uh, so sure enough, the mango man he takes the takes it. He cuts together out his knife. He cuts it all up. He carves it up. And he puts it in a little a little cup, maybe with a little spices on the cup and a stick in the cup. And uh, seeing that, the man whose his happiness has increased. Priya has become moda. Now he's, he's looking at that. He's, he, he's almost going to have that. He's, you know, he, he bought that mango. It's been prepared for him. Now it's being handed to him. He's so happy. And then um, he starts to, he takes that stick, puts the first bite in his mouth. Ah, yes, delicious, delicious. And then another bite and another bite. And his mind and heart, he's filled with a more intense form of happiness is called pramoda. And uh, so he has enjoying the mangoes. He tells the fruit vendor, oh, I love mangoes. I love them more than anything else. They give me such pleasure. They give me such happiness. By this time, he's stuffed the whole mango in his mouth. You know, he's feeling very satisfied. And um, the vendor says, oh, you love mangoes? It gives you happiness? gives you Well, how about another one? Would you like another one? The man looks at, well, that's all right. I, 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 think, I think one's enough for now. And the vendor looks at him, well, what do you mean? He said, you said mangoes give you happiness. Don't you want more happiness? Don't you want some more happiness in your life? No, he says, that, that's enough. Uh... Strange. That would be kind of a strange. You would think that the man, at this point, he would be like a yoga psychologist. He would start to think, hmm, that's peculiar. I'm refusing these mangoes. I love them so much. Why would I be refusing that, refusing the mango? And he would uh, begin to analyze in his, but you'd think that maybe he would, maybe his, he'd think like this. Maybe it's true that the uh, 
happiness and the pleasure is not in the mango itself. Otherwise, why would I be refusing more? The pleasure, when we analyze it, was just common sense. It's the reason I'm getting this satisfaction is because I've satisfied my desire. That it was the des it's because I wanted that uh, I wanted that mango. Kind of made me feel that feeling of want, that feeling of lack. It didn't make me happy. It made me feel very uncomfortable when I bought it and I ate it. Uh, the desire settled down. My mind quieted down. And uh, yoga psychologists, they call it vrittilaya. That means the wave in the mind, which is the, the desire. The mind is calm. The desire comes along. The mind becomes a rose into a wave. What does the wave want to do? It wants to go up and crash onto the shore. When that happens, it quiets down again, and we are at inner peace. So the man is feeling that inner peace. That's Vritilaya. And, uh, well, he didn't think like that, but that, that's just our analysis. It wasn't the, uh, the mango, that is, the happiness was not in the object. That's the lesson that maybe he should have thought, thought there. Once upon a time, there was a merchant who went one day to see a great sage. And uh, he said to him, uh, revered sir, my problem is uh, not material wealth, material things. He said, I have enough material wealth. That's not my problem, but I'm always unsettled in my mind. I'm not fully happy with my life. I have many problems that I think about, and uh, I can't find inner peace. I can't seem to come to terms with the world. Can you help me to find Can you, can you help me to cure this malaise? What should I do? And the sage said, well, um, what you need to do is you need to set off on your travels. And you need to find the happiest man in the world. And then you need to ask him uh, to, uh, for him to give you his shirt. And then you need to put on his shirt. That's my advice. And so the merchant thought, well, okay, that's what I'll do. And so he set off on his travels. And he looked through the town where he lived, where, where, there of a happy man. He found one happy man. He said, are you the happiest man? Well, I'm happy, but you know, somebody down the street here is more happier than I am. Went there, interviewed that man. He was pointed in the direction of another place. He had to go to a, to travel to a different city, to a different state. And like this, from one person to another, found a lot of people who were, people said they were happy, but they, they're not the happiest man at all. So time passed, months passed, years passed. Kept stilly seeking. Finally, he came to a forest where everyone had told him that in that forest, that's where the happiest man lives. And as he set foot there into the, into the forest, sure enough, in the distance, he heard the sound of laughter. And so he moved slowly through the forest, and uh, there, seated in a little meadow, under a tree, seated under a tree, there was a man. And he walked over to the man and he said, uh, Hello. He said, My name is so and so. I come from such and such place, and I want to ask you, are you the happiest man in the world? And the guy says, uh, uh, Yeah, probably. Yeah, I am the happiest man in the world. And then the merchant said, Well, revered sir, he said, My guru, my, my, my spiritual teacher, has given me instructions. He says, He's instructed me to to ask you for your, 
for your shirt. And uh, please, I'm asking you to give, give me your shirt and I'll pay you whatever you want. And the, uh, the man looked at him and he smiled, the happy man, he looked at him, he, he smiled, he said, I don't, I'm not wearing a shirt. In fact, he said, I don't even own a shirt. And uh, the merchant stopped, and there he stood. After all that time, <laughs> that was the answer he got, that uh, he didn't have a shirt. He didn't own a shirt. And at that point, the merchant had a kind of a, of a, of a, of a revelation. And he realized that he'd been traveling all this time, all this distance, traveling and traveling and traveling. And here this guy isn't moving at all. He's just sitting underneath a tree. And the merchant thought that he's been seeking all this time for something that would make him happy, and here's the man, the happiest man in the world, he doesn't have anything. He doesn't even have a shirt. And uh, the, he seems to have, the, the, the merchant was thinking, he said, it's amazing. He seems to have found happiness within himself. And maybe there's no connection between the shirt that I've been seeking all this time and the happiness. And uh, maybe it is that the that the it's the it's the trying to attain that which was unattainable. That means the shirt is what's causing me to be unhappy. Like this, he's thinking. And. Uh, began to realize that the happiness that the sage had found happiness and joy within himself. And in fact, this is a good litmus test for someone who is, um, you may have a question, is, to, is this a person who is walking in the spirit? How would I know if a person's a saint? How would I know if he's a saint or a sage? or if he's living in the spirit? Well, there's a good way that we can tell that, and that such a person is happy. And his happiness does not depend on anything outside of himself. The happiness doesn't come from anything apart from himself. That was the, the lesson that the merchant began to think. Well, let's go back here in our, our story. Let's go back to the guy who was in the market. Let's go back to the man who, had, who just bought the, the uh, mango in the uh, market. He eats the mango. He feels satisfied, and um, then he walks on through the market, up and down. He's looking at this cloth, and he's looking at these flowers, and looking at this and this. And um, it's not long, however, before he starts to feel a little bit hungry again. That means the the sense of satisfaction that he'd gotten from eating that mango just a little bit before is now beginning to dissipate. And uh, it, it was, it's transient. It's short-lived. And not only that. Now he has another problem. Because... Uh, He's now come under the rule of the great law of karma. 
The law of karma tells us that whenever a desire arises in our mind, and whenever we satisfy that desire, it leaves within our psyche a samskara. Now, a samskara is something which we don't know about in Western psychology. It's not a memory trace. But it's a... It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an ener it, it's a center of energy within the psyche. And the nature of the samskara is it's like a, a psychic impression in the mind. It's like a ghost. And there it remains, waiting and waiting, because it wants to materialize itself again. And in fact, when we ourselves go through our lives and we find ourselves in a similar situation again, as we were when we laid down that samskara, now the ghost will come up. A desire will arise in our mind to repeat that same behavior again. Raga dvesha, whether it's positive or negative, works the same way, both ways. So when he comes around again the next day and passes that mango stand, sure enough, the desire will arise in the mind to repeat that experience that he had on the day before. And like this it goes until we begin to build up habits. Habits, tendencies, they're called vasanas. The vasanas now, it's not just an impression. The impressions collate and they build together to form habits and habits build and come together to, to form tendencies. And the tendencies and habits they build to form uh, addictions. That's the way it works. It goes habit, compulsive habit, and addiction. And uh, the addicted person is a person who is caught in an endless cycle of not happiness. It's no kind of happiness to be in a cycle of addiction. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says there's three kinds of happiness. One where you have, you know, it's, in the beginning it's like poison, but later on it's like nectar, amrata. That's good, that's sattvic happiness. Then there's rajasic happiness, sukha. Sanskrit word here, sukha. That means happiness. Then there's rajasic happiness, means it's very pleasurable in the, in the beginning, but later on, you regret it. That's rajasic. But then there's tamasic happiness. Tamasic happiness doesn't kind of fit into those categories. It's not really happiness at all. The word here is moda, delusion. It's delusion in the beginning. It's painful in the beginning, painful in the middle, it's painful in the end. That's tamasic. That's tamasic pleasure. That's intoxication. Intoxicating pleasure. So the... Um, Once upon a time, in ancient India, there was a great king. This is what happens to addiction. Once upon a time, there's a great king. His name was Yayati. Now, Yayati was a Maharaja, and therefore he could live a very rich, pleasurable, happy life. And in fact, he did. He loved life. He had a great lust for life. And he listened every day. He listened to beautiful music. Musicians came from all over every day. He saw plays and went to the theaters and he saw beautiful sights. He ate delicious food and dined, wined and dined. And, uh, but then he grew old. And when he grew old, he realized one day that his life of enjoyment of the world, one thing after the next, after the next. See, the king is, the king is in such a position, he's not like us. He's a guy who can keep adding every day. He, I mean, yes, his pleasures are, are transient, but if he can keep adding them like this, one after the next, after the next, after the next, that's pretty good. That's what he was doing. And so he thought, uh, 
but this thought now came to him, now what's happening? I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. He said, this is terrible. What can I do? I don't want to die. I want to live. I have a great passion for living. And so he thought came into his mind, I know. I'll change bodies with one of my sons. Now it so happens that in ancient India, you know, they could do that. <laughs> Transmigration, if you got the right mantra and you got the right uh, rites and the rituals and you know the, how to do it. So he asked his sons, asked the eldest son, he said, no way. He asked the middle son, no, but the youngest son, he asked, would you trade bodies with me? I want to continue enjoying my life. And the young son said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So they sat down, and they entered into meditation, and they began to repeat the mantras, and they did the mudras and the yantras, and sure enough, the soul of the, of the son left his body and entered into the old body, the old kill, the, old body, the soul of the king, he entered in the body of the young son. And soon the, the king died, the old king died, and now the, 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 body, the king body died. And now the king, he wakes up one morning, ah, he looks at himself, got a fresh new young body, and he starts living his life again. Every day he listens to great music. He sees wonderful sights, and he begins to enjoy wines and dines every day, live day after day, month after year after year. Time passed. One day he's standing before the mirror, and he looks a little closer. He looks in the mirror, and there he sees his skin. There's a little wrinkle there on his skin there. Hair has become gray. He's become older, and uh, he begins to realize that uh, he's approaching death, and that this life, too, is coming to an end. And he thinks, he realizes also with great dismay that uh, he won't be able to enjoy um, the world of the senses anymore. And uh, yet he still feels within himself a great feeling of desire. Oh, I'm going too slow here. Too bad. Um, he feels within himself a great sense of desire and um, longing. And uh, But he struck. He struck with the... With the with the predicament, this situation, how he's gotten himself and how absurd his life has become. But he's in the jatu, kama, kama, nam, obobhogi, nashamiti, havisha, krishna, vart, maya, vabhuyo, eva, vivardate. He realized. He said, you know, all this time I've been pursuing desires, but the satisfaction of desires just uh, doesn't give you lasting happiness. It only makes the fire of desire increase more intensely as if you're pouring butter and ghee onto a fire. So that was the realization of the king Yayati. So the um, uh, what's the lesson? The lesson then is that pleasure, since pleasure is not happiness, since pleasure doesn't give us happiness, now, how then can we can't stop seeking for happiness, though? So how can we uh, get some happiness? Now, uh, well, the Greeks had a good idea. The Greeks had a very good idea, and they believed that um, they weren't so much interested in pleasure. They rejected hedonism. Hedonism is the name of, not the name of a... Uh, of a guy, it doesn't mean a man, it means a hedon, hedon means pleasure. It rejects hedonism, but they had the idea, all the Greek philosophers, they shared this quest for what they called eudaimonia, well-being, a kind of a more long-lasting, deeper, more mature sense of happiness that uh, would be equivalent to what in psychology today we call self-actualization. That's what they pursue. They say, how can we realize that kind of happiness? That's the purpose. How to live well. 
And uh, in order to do so, they uh, had the idea, how can we find out? Well, they said, well, why don't we just study the lives of all the great men and all of the uh, eminent men in the city, and we find out the successful men, see what qualities they have, what are their virtues. And just sure enough, they did that, and they made all, they realized that, yes, they all shared similar virtues, followed their, governed their lives, were uh, governed by reason and self-control, and they had, uh, they had courage, and they had wisdom. And they had uh, strength and justice and all those great noble Greek qualities of the Greek uh, virtues. And so like that, they thought, they came to the conclusion, the great insight of Greek philosophy, virtue is happiness. Virtue is happiness. And... Uh, that was their idea, that lasting, abiding, mature, deeper sense of happiness comes to us through self-actualization, through realizing our inner potential, and through pursuing high-minded, lofty goals in life. Happiness. Once upon a time, there was a mouse. Now the mouse, uh, he told his mother and father that he was going to, now we're going to talk here about self-actualization. This is a mouse. Told his mother and father that he was going on a trip to the seashore. And the mother and the father were very shocked and very concerned. They said, that's very dangerous. He said, yeah, please, please don't go. And the little mouse said, no, I'm sorry, I've made up my mind. Uh, I've made my decision. I've never been to the seashore. I've never seen the ocean. And it's high time that I do. And therefore, tomorrow, I'm going to set off. And uh, the mother and the father said, well, we can't do anything about that. But please, be careful. And so the mouse, the very next morning, he set off on his journey. And uh, sure enough, it wasn't just hardly through the beginning of the, of the morning that he found himself in great difficulty. He was chased by a cat. He ran and he ran and he left a little piece of his tail in the mouth of the cat. Somehow he managed to escape. He hid behind a rock. He continued on his journey. He was attacked by birds. Birds came and pecked at him, and he ran away. And he was, he was all pecked, and he was fearful, and he was attacked by a dog. And the dog came barking after him, and he ran. He was exhausted, and he was tired, but he kept on his journey, kept on his destiny. Uh, kept going toward climbing, climbing this hill, the last hill that he had to climb there before he got to the ocean. And uh, finally, around the time of sunset, he got to the top of the hill. There he sat there. And he was tired, and there was all blood on his body, and he was tired and he was exhausted. But he looks over, there he sees the seashore. The great ocean lying before him. Yes, what a beautiful sight, he thought. Rested there. He's sitting now on the top of the mountain. He's attending his peak experience. And the sun is just setting. And the, how beautiful, how beautiful it is. He said, look at the colors on the water. I wish that my mother and father were here. But they could see this beautiful sight. He felt so happy, he felt so content now after his long journey. And the sun gradually set. Then the moon came out, and the stars came out. He looked up at the sky, looked down at the beautiful waters, and uh, felt a great sense of peace, a sense of achievement, a sense of uh, accomplishment. And... Uh, that's the moral of the story, that uh, all the, the miles of a long road 
It's worth it in the end to achieve a moment of true happiness. Of true happiness. So we see then that the journey of the mouse in pursuit of his higher ideals, in pursuit of a higher vision, and uh, personal achievements, self-actualization, and the Greeks, what the Greeks call the virtue ethics. They do, they give us a more abiding, deeper sense of happiness and fulfillment. But still, something is wanting. Something is left out. We live in a relative world. And for all of our striving, for all of our efforts, whatever happiness we find, will be limited. It will be limited by time and therefore temporary and in perspective uh, transient. It will be imperfect because it's subject to the world relative world so everything is subject to the pairs of opposites. Every happiness that we get there will be something wrong with it. That's a coin. Everything, everything, everything is a coin with two sides. We look closely enough. We see turn the coin on, uh, positive and negative. And it will be, um, it will not, it will be limited. It will not be infinite. It will not be unlimited. It will be limited in quantity. It will be limited in quality. It will be limited by time. And all this to our minds and hearts is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Why is that? Yuvayabhuma tatsad upanishad Yuvayabhuma tatsukam nalpehe sukamasti That's the aphorism. Sukam, that means happy. They're talking, we're using the word here, happiness. And it says there in the verse, Yulvaibhuma tatsukam, that is, happiness is in that which is big, the great, the unlimited. There is no happiness in the finite. That's the vision of the uh, sages of the Upanishads. Happiness is in that which is. Uh, Swami Vivekananda says, expansion is life, contraction is death. We seek for life, we seek expansion, we seek yes, to become greater and greater, to become more and more unlimited. What we search for is unlimited happiness. In fact, what we're looking for is Brahman. Brahman is the Sanskrit word for infinite happiness. The word for Sanskrit root there means uh, uh, the, the root there means big. And Brahman, the word Brahman means bigness. Anything big is something's bigger than that. The, big, the biggest thing in the universe that is that which is infinite is Brahman. And Brahman is defined as infinite being, as infinite conscious, pure consciousness, and as infinite bliss. Now the, uh, the, the yoga psychologists and the, and, and the saints and the sages of ancient India, they weren't content with the words happiness, although I've used the word sukham, which is happiness. They were interested in happiness and what we would call well-being, their word for true happiness is ananda. Now ananda means, uh, we could translate it maybe as, as joy, as bliss. 
But ananda is not sense pleasure. Ananda is not um, in, in any, it's not emotional pleasure. It's not an emotional, happy, jumping up and down sort of pleasure. And it's also not a ego, it's not the kind of pleasure that comes from ego gratification and self-actualization and achievement. It's not that kind of happiness. It's a, an impersonal, a transcendental happiness, and most important of all, anantam vai ananda. That means it is defined as infinite. That which is infinite is, by definition, by Indian philosophy, is bliss, blissful. When you become infinite, you become happy. You become infinitely happy. Why? Because for the, by virtue of the very fact that you are infinite. And so, uh, this is what we want. This is what, this is what we want. We want to become, we want infinite happiness. Unlimited joy and uh, we want to become Brahman, really. Brahman is infinite happiness. We want infinite happiness. So if we were, that would be, that's kind of our, what we really want. And, uh, but, uh, what about the fact that uh, we're, we're finite? We are finite. We are limited, jivatmas, we're little, we have a body, we have a mind, we're embodied souls, we have a body, we have a mind, we have a limited soul, and uh, how is it possible for the jiva, the jivatma, the, ji, the soul, the embodied soul, that is ah, me, how is it possible for me, the limited being that I am, to contain the infinite Brahman? How is it possible for the finite to attain the infinite? How can the finite being attain something which is infinite? And it seems like it, uh, it's impossible. And it is impossible. It's impossible to attain Brahman. It's impossible for us to become Brahman. Uh, the only solution to the problem, but we can't stop seeking for that infinite Brahman. We can't stop that. We're driven by that from within. And yet we can't Brahm become Brahman. That's impossible. The only solution to the problem is that you are Brahman. That's the teaching of the Vedanta philosophy. That you already are Brahman. That there's no becoming involved here. It's about being. Thou art that. That means the Atman in your true self. Thou art that. That means you are that infinite divine being, that infinite bliss which you seek is your own true self. That's the lesson that we learn from the, uh, that's the teaching example that we learn from the Brahmin widow. Now, there was a Brahmin widow who lived in a small little cottage, and she owned a necklace. It was a necklace that had a lot of um, uh, gemstones in it, 
And so it was very expensive. It was worth a lot of money. But it was not precious to her for that reason. She didn't care about it. it was, to her, it was valueless. It was an heirloom that had been passed down, from a, down in her family for many generations. And it gave her sense of, such a sense of belonging and security and happiness every day to wear that necklace around her neck. Now one morning, she woke from sleep and she reached over to get her necklace and uh, felt around there on top of the dresser. No necklace. What? What? What happened? Where is that? What, did it fall down? She got up, looked down behind the uh, chest of drawers there. Nothing there. Looked under the bed. What? what? No. This, she was shocked. Couldn't believe it. What, what, what's happened here? I can't believe it. She looked around on the floor, looked around on, in the, on the bed. It wasn't there. No, no, she thought. What's it, how it's happened? It's gone. I can't believe it. And uh, so she kind of shuffled around there. She walked out, ran out into the kitchen. She was just all distraught. She, she began looking through the cupboard, left it on the counter here, left it in the cupboard, opened the cupboard. By this time, she'd become very angry. Where is that thing? What did I, where did I put it? Can't be gone. That's impossible. See, so living in denial. And uh, so she looks her anger. She looked there, throwing pots and everything. Else. They're not in the kitchen either. Now it's terrible. Where has it gone? It must be gone. She was go or walked in and the, into, the, into the parlor. Look around there. And she couldn't find it anywhere. And she became more and more distraught. She became more and more thought, realized, my, loss, my necklace is lost. She began to feel the impact of this terrible tragedy. And she felt depressed. And she began to lose all hope. She began to feel despair, a feeling of despair. She just sank down and just collapsed on the floor. And uh, they heard a knock on the door. Knock on the door. It's her neighbor. She opened the door. The neighbor is there. Oh, hello. Good day. Oh, she's in tears. What's happened? What happened to you? I've lost my most precious necklace. Has been lost. And the neighbor looks and says, "What? Your necklace? What's that? What's that around your neck?" She looked down, and she couldn't believe. She looked down. She began. Oh my! She smiled. Yeah, she began to laugh. And she began to she could, she began to dance up and down. She began to sing. She was filled with happiness and joy. The lost necklace had been found. And uh, so that's the Vedantic teaching story about happiness. It's a story about a woman who. Uh, the story about the pursuit of happiness. And uh, where could she find this? Where did she look for the happiness? Well, she looked uh, behind the dresser. Was it there? No. Looked under the bed. Wasn't there. She looked out in the kitchen of the cupboards. Couldn't find the happiness anywhere in the house. And as a result of which, she was so distraught, she was so depressed, and she was so despairing, she lost all hope. And then the knock came at the door, and there was the neighbor. The neighbor, who's, who's the neighbor? The neighbor in the story is the Vedanta Darshana. It's the Vedanta Darshana. Darshana means Darpana, means mirror. It's the mirror that shows us what's going on, reminds us of where the happiness is. It's the Vedanta philosophy. It's the, it's the teachings of the, Veda, of the Vedanta philosophy points us in the right direction towards infinite, unlimited, happiness. 
ओम दियो शांति अंतरिक्ष शांति पृथ्वी शांति आप शांति ओ सदाया शांति वनस्पतया शांति विश्व देवा शांति ब्रह्म शांति सारवा शांति शांति रे व शांति सा मे शांति रे ओम शांति 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 ओम पीस इज इन हेवन पीस इज ऑन द अर्थ पीस इज इन द स्काय इन द वाटर्स द हर्ब्स एंड प्लांट्स एंड ट्रीज आर फुल ऑफ पीस द गॉड्स आर पीसफुल मे दिस इटर्नल यूनिवर्सल पीस enter our souls and beings om peace 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 be unto us all